lesson from the letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the Romans. Brethren, I speak in a human way because of the weakness of your flesh. For as you yielded your members as slaves of uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, so now yield your members as slaves of justice unto sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free as regards justice, but what fruit had you then from those things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death, but now, set free from sin and become slaves to God, you have your fruit unto sanctification, and as your end, life everlasting. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life everlasting in Christ Jesus our Lord. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of false prophets who will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. By their fruits you will know them. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Saving words of the gospel. Please kneel for your prayer for vocations. Let us ask God to give worthy priests, brothers, and sisters to his holy church. O God, we earnestly beseech thee to bless this diocese with many priests, brothers, and sisters who will love thee with their whole strength and gladly spend their entire lives to serve thy church and to make thee known and loved. Bless our families, bless our children. Mary, Queen of the Clergy. I have pages of announcements to read. Father Heilman will be on vacation through Friday, August 2nd. Therefore, there will be no weekday masses here at 7.30. A retired gentleman living in the south side of Madison near Fish Hatchery Road and the Dean Clinic is looking for a ride to the traditional Latin Mass on Sunday at 7.30 a.m., which is this Mass. Anyone who can help him out, please call the parish office. There will be Vespers this evening at 4.30 p.m., followed by a potluck in school at approximately 5.15. All are invited. Bring a dish to pass. I think that means bring a dish to share. Also, if you have any objects that you would like to have blessed, please uh, bring them back to the sacristy right away after Mass. I'd be happy to bless them for you. Uh, we have beautiful hand missiles uh, available for you at a great reduction of price provided for us by um, Angelus Press. Uh, they're lovely things. And um, at the same time, remember that we're working on a spiritual bouquet for our new bishop, for Bishop Hying. Now, you can go online and participate in this by going to latinmassmadison.org, latinmassmadison, all one word, dot org, and you can fill out an online form there. But we also have some good old-fashioned paper that you can use, too, and you'll find sheets uh, near the aforementioned uh, hand missiles on the table out in the, in the narthex area. 
spiritual bouquets give a real boost to the ones who receive them, believe me. And the life and work of a bishop is very difficult. And our new guy here, he hasn't been our skipper for very long, about a month now, and I'm sure he uh, would very much appreciate uh, knowing that spiritual bouquets are being gathered and then presented to him. I always get a boost out of them when I get them. I know that he will too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We have, um, speaking of hand missiles, <clears throat> sometimes it's a, it's a very good thing to, in exploring the, the readings and so forth, or prayers that are coming up in the, in the next, for the next week, maybe about halfway through the week, you could start looking ahead at the Sunday to come to see what's going to be there so that you're familiar with the mass formulary ahead of time. So when you come in, you're able really to listen carefully and hear, to hear what the Lord wants to offer you through Holy Church's choice of readings and prayers and chants. Well, and one of the things that you can do with a hand missile is also explore in a kind of a, a, a single glance. You can see the whole formulary for Mass laid out very beautifully. And that includes the chants of the Mass. These antiphons are also important. You know, there's a structure in Mass. You'll find an, an antiphon and a procession and a greeting and a prayer. That's what we have at different stages during Mass. There will be an antiphon like the intro at the very beginning, right? A procession comes in. There's a greeting, Dominus Obiscum, and then a prayer. And we find this pattern repeated all through Mass. Sometimes it's a little hidden. For example, at the offertory time, the procession is very short with the, uh, the things being brought to the altar. It's water and wine. Now in a Mass like this, we'll have it on the altar already, but in a solemn Mass, the chalice and so forth are brought up. It's the same thing. There's an antiphon song, procession with the things needed for Mass. Eventually, the priest, there's a Dominus Obiscum, and there's a quiet prayer that time. And the pattern repeats itself toward the end of Mass when there's communion. And the communion procession, of course, involves you. But it's the same thing. Then after that, there's the antiphon, the procession, you come for communion, and then you hear the greeting from the priest, Dominus Obiscum, and then there's the final oration of Mass. This repeats itself all the way through. So you can see how these blocks that are built in, these building blocks of Holy Mass, have their chants in them. So the chants are important also. So, and very often these chants are setting the tone for how you were to hear the other things going on. How, you, how do you hear the orations? How do you hear the readings? Well, a lot of this is based on the chant. It's one of the reasons why our scola cantorum in churches across the world is so important. Why they have to do their very best. You know, why the, the singing is, is so important. As Augustine, St. Augustine says, singing belongs to one who loves. Singing belongs to the lover. It's a different thing to speak a prayer, and it's another thing entirely to sing it. There's something more important in the singing something more important and your participation in the singing is by careful hearing by careful listening but also in those moments which pertain to you your own singing too then is God Christ singing with your voice back to the Father remember every word every prayer even the words of scripture are all offerings being raised back to the Father that's part of the dynamic of our spiritual worship so paying attention to these these chants is very important. And uh, when we have them sung beautifully, it's, it's only that much greater glory given to God. I encourage uh, young men who are, or older men who are able to sing uh, to think about uh, offering your service uh, to sing uh, with the men in the choir, uh, in the Scola Cantorum. And I would not be displeased at all if there were a group of women who wanted to form a Scola Cantorum. I would not be displeased at all. I directed a women's group in Rome for many years, and they sang beautifully. They sang truly, angelically, beautifully. The, these things are all helpful for us and for our participation in the liturgical action. Now, the chant at the very beginning of Mass 
we hear all you peoples clap your hands, shout to God with cries of gladness. And then there's a, a verse that follows that, which explains one of the reasons why we're doing that. We describe God as excelsus and terribilis and magnus. The Lord, the Most High, is awesome. He is the great king over all the earth. And so we raise our hands up to God, and we raise our voices in joy and shouts up to God. And this intro, it sets the tone for Mass. But it's not the only thing that then's going to go into Mass. There are other elements as well. We start then to hear after that quite a few contrasts. For example, in the letter from Paul, we hear contrasts of death and life, uh, joy uh, and shame, you know, the fruits that the old man still caught in the old creation, in the flesh, in the worldly things have, as opposed to what is offered to those who are belong to the new creation, who are remade a new creation in Christ. We have the wages of sin, which are as death, and we have the gift of God, which is everlasting life. You know, wages are something that you take because you've done work. You reach out and out of justice, you take them because they are due to you. On the other hand, life everlasting is described as a gift. The wages of sin is death, as something that we take. We took death. We take death in sin. But life everlasting is a gift that has to be received. The receiving and taking are two very different things, especially intentionally and attitudinally. And go, we go back to the very beginning, the beginning of the entire human race. You remember what happened when the enemy went at Eve and she took the fruit. She was trying to take for herself something instead of receiving what God wanted to give as a gift. She tried to reach out and take it. And that's so significant because you think about how Eve is the, the pinnacle of creation. You know, there are two creation accounts. In, Gen in, the, fir in the first chapter of Genesis, we hear how about how all humanity was created in the image and likeness of God. Male and female, he created that man, right? Male and female in the image and likeness of God, which demonstrates the perfect equality of the sexes, perfect equality and dignity of, all, of every person, male or female, before God, every one of them made in God's image and likeness. Then there's the second account of the creation of man in the second chapter of Genesis, where a little more time is spent spinning it out in that sixth day. What happens? God draws Eve forth from Adam's side. So Eve is really the last one created before God rests. She's the, the pinnacle, the jewel of all creation. And in these two different modes of being human being, in image and likeness of God, Paul eventually comes along and begins to explain the modality of what it is to be masculine before God, what it is to be feminine before God, and it all goes back to, crea to the creation accounts in Genesis. The man is presented as the one who in his body and his actions and his being is, represents or symbolizes the active, the transcendent, the one who gives the origin of things while feminine is, is Im, the embodiment of the imminent and closeness and reception. Now, which of these two things is better? Well, it's a trick question, because you have to have both of them. Both of them are equal in dignity, as we understand from that first chapter in Genesis. Both equal in dignity before God, but expressing two different things about God and teaching us about how we are to be before God. As a matter of fact, the human soul is always described as 
feminine because the human soul needs to receive. So if we're a man or a woman, we have a soul. We always are like the bride before the bridegroom in our souls, ready to receive humbly and with submission. But Eve reached out, and instead of being the one who received humbly and in submission to God's will, she reached out at the behest of the enemy and took. And that ruined the, the plan. It ruined the paradigm. It broke the hierarchy and order of relations between God and man and between each other. And so... As a matter of fact, this is, <laughs> this is one of the reasons I'm just going to digress for a moment, maybe whet your appetite. I can come in another time and talk about how Paul explains this whole business of hierarchy and masculine and feminine and how we are before God. When in, the, the, in, the, in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 12, he starts talking about women having to wear head coverings in church, right? Like chapel veils and so forth that we have now. There was a controversy about that in the early church. And in Corinth, some women were not covering their heads when they were praying, and, and some men were. And he tries to explain to them, you know, what's wrong with this, with this picture? This can't be done. And the word, that he, the word that he uses to describe the covering that a woman should have in her head, exousia, it's, which in, in Latin came in as potestas. It means authority, that she should have authority over her. Right? That she should have authority. Well, man doesn't have that covering. Because as he explains, the father is the head of Christ as the man is the head of the woman. Now again, this doesn't imply inequality of any kind. Because if that's the paradigm, the father is the head of Christ and man is head of the woman, Christ isn't inferior to the father. They're both God. They're both divine. And yet within that relationship, there's a hierarchy. Christ was submissive and humble to his own creatures. He submitted to his own creatures. That didn't make him less God. Hierarchy does not imply inequality. Hierarchy implies different modalities of living, embodying different things, showing forth in our own flesh, for example, different aspects of how God wants us to interact with him and with each other. That's what these things are. He wrote, just as we have lessons that we can glean from scripture, and we have lessons that we can glean from our prayers and so forth in Holy Mass, the church is lovingly put together, and all these things become points where we can draw things. So too, the very book of nature begins to teach us about who we are before God and who we aren't, who we are to each other and who we mustn't be. The wages of which Paul speaks, the wages of sin being death, stem from this idea of reaching out and taking, seizing something that isn't appropriate for you. And the wages that wa the wage of that that you grasp is death. Whereas God wants to give gifts, beautiful gifts, gifts of life, but we have to be humble and submissive before God to receive them in the right way. Now there is one other point in this that I wanted to make about these readings and so forth that we have today. We have fruit images too. We have fruit, the fruit images in Paul. We have the fruit images from our Lord in the gospel talking about the trees that bear good fruit or bad fruit and so forth. He says in there rather dramatically, every tree that does not bear good fruit is to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, Well, look at it this way. I had, I lived in a place once where there were a lot of apple trees. 
and uh, they were beautiful trees. They flowered beautifully. They were lovely to look at. Um, they were had you know beautiful shape, and they they bore you know lots of apples, and the apples looked really great and so forth. But then the fall would come along. You get that first frost, you know, that you're waiting for when you're really waiting for you know good apples when it's time to harvest those apples and pick them. And you'd wait for that first frost, and you get that that pick those apples. And, you know, I, you'd pick the apples off these trees and you'd bite, you know, take a bite out of them and you'd kind of go, meh. They just weren't really very good. They looked great, but they just weren't very good. I think you probably will have this experience if you go down to the grocery store and buy something like, you know, peaches, right? I mean, you never know what you're going to get. They look beautiful, but they might not be very good. They might not taste like anything. On the other hand, there was on this property, it was, the one, it was one very close to a little chapel, there was an older apple tree that was in kind of bad shape and you know, wasn't so beautiful and it had been you know, distressed here and there. And, and uh, it bore uh, apples that weren't you know, quite as big. It's probably a different variety of apple tree. I'm not an apple expert. But those apples were spectacular. They were really good. They didn't look as good. They didn't look as, as, you know, amazing. But they were truly wonderful apples. Now, going, circling back to this issue of the fruit, the Lord says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I think we can include in this every tree that, bore, that bears meh fruit, uninteresting fruit, insipid fruit, doesn't bear good fruit. You don't have to be overtly wicked. Sometimes all, it's enough to lose that great savor-giving sap that only God can give by being meh. Last uh, week I talked about mailing it in. This is the same kind of thing. Remember the images that the Lord uses for the uncommitted, for the unconverted. If salt loses its flavor, its saltiness, what good is it? You throw it out and you, you trample on it. Remember what he says about the people in, in, in Revelation 3, I think it is. He talks about the lukewarm, right? The tepid, they're neither hot nor cold. What's he going to do? He's going to spew them out of his mouth. As a matter of fact, the old Dowie translation has it even better. He will vomit them out of his mouth. Not spew, he'll vomit them. The meh soul, the meh Catholic, the one who mails it in, who's tepid, who's lukewarm, who doesn't have that savor, the one who is not bearing necessarily even really horrible fruit or overt evil, but isn't barely bearing much good fruit either. There's just kind of meh is going to be vomited out of the Lord's mouth at the time of judgment. There are different ways that we can lose the gift that the Lord wants to give. He wants to give to the humble, to the submissive, to those who are grateful and loving. We can be overtly evil and hack ourselves off from the life that, that he wants to give. And we can also just be meh and mail it in. We have to, you know, I'm talking about mixing metaphors, we, have, we can't mail it in, we have to bear good fruit. Well, that's about as mixed a metaphor as you can get, but I think I'm getting my point across. Being unconverted and going through the motions 
is not enough. Routine is good when it's disciplined and chosen and willed. Routine when it's thoughtless, just going through the motions, is not enough. Weekly Mass, a prayer here and there, maybe a, you know, a good work here and there. You beat your breast a little bit if you're going through a bad time. And go to Mass again. Oh yeah, confession once in a while. Our lives have to be intentional. Our lives of faith have to be thought through, carefully chosen, willed, planned, disciplined, in love for God and in pursuit of true holiness, which is rooted, of course, in first and foremost in love of God and therefore submission and humility receptivity to everything that he wants to give us instead of reaching out and taking or being negligent and careless and being and drifting off let's choose the gift the gift to receive the gift and then do wonderful things with it going back to another another parable Remember all the servants who received the various talents, right? They had to multiply them. The master came back and he found that these two guys over here, they really put them to work. And this other guy, what did he do? He hid it in the ground and didn't do anything with it. Didn't go so well for him. So much has been given into our hands. So much is being offered to us. With what gratitude should we approach everything that our Lord wants to give in every word, gesture of sacred liturgy, and all of the things that are written into our beings, into our very flesh, by God's will, who knew us from before the creation of the universe. All of these things are hints, suggestions to us about how we ought to live. Do we have ears to hear it? And believe me, friends, I'm speaking to myself while I'm speaking to you as well. This is something that all of us, every single one of us, has to, has to confront in good, careful examinations of conscience. Not just about the day, but about the whole trajectory of life. Where am I going? What am I doing? How am I doing it and why? This is the living, the intentional life of a Catholic saved by Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.